Hello and welcome to the Awakened Feminine Podcast. I'm your host, Kaki Lee, and my mission is to share the love and wisdom of inspiring women from around the world who have gone through adversity and turned their pain into purpose. Today, I'm excited to share the love and wisdom of writer, blogger, and encourager, Cara McLaughlin, who is joining me all the way from North Carolina in the USA. Welcome, Cara. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here today. Yes, I'm excited to have you on. Thank you so much for being on my podcast. Um, before we get started, do you mind sharing with us in a couple of sentences who you are and you know what you what you do? Okay, great. Um, yes, I you know I'm a writer and encourager, but mostly I believe I'm a storyteller. I mean, I've always dreamed of I've always loved to share and write stories of encouragement. And my dream as a kid was to be the next lowest lane. I wanted to become a hometown, you know, newspaper reporter, and so that was actually one of my first first jobs coming out of uh, high school was to work for my hometown newspaper. But since that time, that's been my common theme is to share that love and encouragement through storytelling, whether it's working in my hometown newspaper or writing radio ads or working in uh, the advertising agency world. I worked for a while on Starbucks and corporate uh, brands like McDonald's and Starbucks. But um, since that time, it's been a wonderful journey of just sharing encouragement and love of of stories uh, over time. And so that's why I'm so excited that we're here today to talk about circles and how we can share encouragement in circles. Yeah, I'm excited to get into that topic. Um, and I want to ask you, because I always love to ask my guests this question as well, before we kind of dive into the journey or into our conversations is, you know, what is your definition of an awakened feminine? It's such a great question. And I love it. I love the theme of your podcast with the awakened feminine. And for me personally, I believe it's a person who knows who they are and knows what they want. And that, that story represents for me personally is a time when I was about 10 years old. I remember as a kid, you know, I had three older brothers and we loved to be outdoors and climb trees. And so we would go to this nearby park every day. And um, I can remember going to, to a nearby park and we had these gorgeous cra- cra- crab apple trees in our park and I'm just climbing up over these pink blossoms in the spring and climbing all the way to the top. And just sitting at that top of the tree and just saying, I know who I am and I know what I want. And, you know, not that you would always have it always figured out, but I always remember that place in my heart of that 10 year old girl yeah. who just knows who she is and knows what she wants. And not that you always have it figured out and you always know what you're doing, but to have that reference point when you're considering struggles or when you're considering decisions is to be able to look back into that place, kind of your internal compass for perspective to say, is this on target or off target? Is this, does this synchronize with my heart for who I am and what I want? And so I believe truly an awakened feminine is a person who knows who they are and knows what they want. Mm, such a beautiful definition. Like just, oh, I've just got all the feels. So thank you for sharing that. <laughs> I love it. So Cara, I just want to um, quickly kind of dive into your journey a bit so people can have a taste of, you know, what you kind of been through, I guess, before we jump into the circles um, topic that we're going to talk about today. Um, Because, you know, you were just talking about you working in corporate before, but then, you know, kind of developing into this, you know, storyteller and sharing words of encouragement. And I know you've also published a book. So your book is called Nourish Encouragement for Parents Homeschooling Through High School, which I know because, um, you know, you're very passionate about homeschooling and you homeschooled your son for 10 years. And that's kind of like a celebration of that journey. So, and you've been published in like Chicken Soup for the Soul as well, which, you know, is a series that I love to read as well. So it's just so intriguing. And, you know, I think he's such an amazing human being. I want to ask you, like, you know, kind of what led you into this going from corporate to kind of going into this sharing encouragement in a journey. Sure, yeah. I mean, I shared a little bit about my background. So coming mm. through the storytelling journey of working in pretty much every aspect of storytelling over time and then um, taking a break from all of that. My son was struggling at the time and about third grade. And so I decided to take a break from all of the, the corporate life to homeschool him because I really felt like I needed to step in and help him with that. Um, and so that was an amazing adventure of of both creating a feast of learning for him, but also redeeming my own education at the same time. Mm -hmm. And so um, as a result of that, I felt like I I really wanted to pay it forward. You know, so many people had come alongside of me in that journey and 
you know, as we talked about, you know, circles look different over time, but at that season, like having other homeschoolers that came alongside me, we would sit every Thursday when my kid, my son was getting, you know, in his different learning experiences, they would, we would sit on Thursdays and we would just either talk or laugh or cry or pray or whatever it was, but having others, other people that could pour into me and, and basically encourage me on this journey to say, you can do this and you can, you can um, survive and thrive and enjoy this process. So through the, through as, you know, as over time, I've come to realize the power of doing life in circles and, and the power of, of others coming alongside me in this journey. And so, you know, as a result of that, I wanted to pay it forward with my book of, of 10 years of lessons from homeschooling to just share that lesson and all that I've learned through that time. So that's kind of a, in a nutshell, my journey from there. And since that time, I'm now a full-time writer and encourager. I love sharing inspiring stories that can remind people that they can live their best, best life with the power of others alongside them. Yeah, I love that. And we're gonna jump into the circles, but um, now. So what we wanna talk about today is the power of cultivating a vibrant circle. And it's such a, you know, it's such a topic that's close to my heart because last year, you know, with everything going on in the world, um, I ended up meeting a lot of different people online through different courses that I was doing. And, you know, um, you have your friends, you have your family, but they don't seem to like understand you, like what you're doing, right? Because they, they just think, oh, yeah, yeah, Kaki's doing this or, you know, she's my daughter, whatever. But, you know, for me, what it was stepping into that coaching and entrepreneur space and it was like I didn't have any friends around me that understood. So when I met these women, is this circle, well, a circle of women, it was like, whew, <laughs> I have support. I have people that understand what I'm going through. So, um, you know, so it's such a topic that's very, very, you know, close to my heart. And I haven't actually even talked about it before. So I'm just, I was so glad when you went, oh, do you want to talk about that? I'm like, yes, you know, and of course I wanted to talk about homeschooling, but this was just like, yes, it was like the, yeah. <laughs> so I want to ask you why, you know, for you, do you think it's so important to have different circles of people to support you and, you know, just be with you you know, guide you, cry with you, whatever it is. Right. Yeah. Well, I think back, you know, when I was in my twenties and I, I had this, what I call the lone wolf syndrome, you know, I was working in the advertising agency world and I was trying to be this success 101. I wanted to project this image of having it all together and having life all figured out. And I knew what I was doing. You know, I was working a million hours. I was, you know, trying to look like I had it all together, but I wasn't eating. I wasn't sleeping. And I really was quietly dying on the inside, you know, and I felt like I was alone. And I had this expression where I said, if it's going to be, it's up to me, you know, and sometimes that works, but a lot of times it doesn't. And I was pr pretty much like killing myself with work. And so that all worked great until I lost my job and I was no longer working. And so now all I had to show for it was anxiety and ulcers. And now I had lost all my confidence because I had put all of my confidence in my job. Mm -hmm. And so what I really long for, even though I would never have told you at the time, is I long for others to come alongside me and show me a better way of living. You know, and since that time, I've come to recognize that it's it's so much more powerful to have others that can pour into you and that you don't have to do life alone. Um, there, you know, I'm not the first person to talk about circles. Andy mm -hmm. Stanley is a famous writer and famous pastor from the States, and he's written and taught extensively about circles. And he has this um, famous quote where he says, life change happens in circles, not rows. And while he's talking about the church, so to speak, I think it also works beautifully for life to say, if you really want to be serious about life change, surround yourself with people that can help spur you along and encourage you on this journey. And since that time in my 20s, I've learned like what a relief it is not to have to do life alone. And I've had a variety of um, different kinds of circles since then. And so I've had writer's circles where we would meet weekly and swap story ideas and critique each other's writing and spur one another on. And I've had, like I mentioned earlier, homeschooling circles yeah. had marriage and family circles at times through, like through our faith community where we would go through a book and we would meet every week and we would talk about like how 
how can we make our marriages better? How can we make our relationships better? And so, and as well, I've had different fitness circles. My husband and I met, ran a marathon together. And so we had others pour into us with um, how to do nutrition and how to run well and all the different things. And so I've had so many different varieties of circles and that's what's so cool about it is it doesn't have to look a certain way but it can be about like, what is my greatest struggle or what is my greatest dream? And how can I bring forth more of that in my life to be able to thrive and grow and move in the direction that I long to live? So I believe life gets really good when you when you live it in a circle. Mm, yeah, I want to ask you, I mean, there's probably people thinking, well, like, you, you know, I guess a bit like me, when you're so used to your environment and you don't think that there are other people out there that understand you where do you go and find these people like that that are your people that understand right well I think it starts with being brave like you have to be willing to say okay I just want I'm going to take a leap of faith and be be a little bit brave to be vulnerable and put myself out there and just to say you know hey I want to see what's possible for me you know and I think it's about kind of looking at what's before me right now what is right, who's on my path currently, whether it's at work or school or with your job or in your neighborhood, it's kind of like looking and saying, all right, what's on my path right now? And, you know, I'm a person of faith. And so I'm very big on saying, hey, God, you know, I really need some help with health or I really need some help with nutrition, you know, whatever it might be. And inviting, inviting God to direct your path and to say mm-hmm. like, hey, I'm going to put people on your path that are going to help you. But I think it's starting with that awareness and being brave and also being willing to be open. You know, Mm. um, a couple of years ago, I decided I wanted more fresh voices and fresh wisdom in my life, but I wasn't quite sure how to create that or where I could even start. And so there was a community called She Loves, and it was this online magazine community, and they were forming circles. And I thought, hey, you know, that could be a cool way to just invite fresh voices and fresh wisdom and fresh creativity in my life. So I signed up for this circle and I thought, what have I done? Like, I don't know who these people are. I'm not exactly, I don't even know. And so if you look at us on paper, you would just yawn because we were so uninteresting. It was like a grandma from New Jersey. It was me at the time. I was a homeschooling mom from North Carolina. It was like a a professor from Canada and then this nonprofit lady in Florida. And on paper, you would think, oh my gosh, they're the most, who cares? Like, they're not interesting people. And we had no rules for our group. We would just get together monthly and we would show up and we'd have a theme. So it could be like renewal or joy or um, leap, whatever the theme was. And our, we would have no agenda, no structure. And I thought, this is a terrible idea. Like, how is this even gonna work for anybody? And so we would hold this time just to let it be what it needed to be. And yeah. I tell you, that group has been more powerful than I could ever have imagined. And we've walked through, you know, at first we were really clunky and we were, you know, getting to know each other yeah. as all groups are. But over time we evolved. And once we began to trust each other and lean in and know each other's stories, mm. um, that group has become so powerful from a place of both the sacred and just the simple celebrations of life. Like we've walked through some really difficult things. Like how do you, how do you deal with the crushing feeling of loneliness or anxiety or mm crushing hard things for work or loss. Like my dad had passed away during this season Mm. um, last April. And so having others that could come alongside me um, and support me in that process, or whether it was dealing with family or loved ones or, and celebrating good things too. Like we, that group has, has birthed a lot of cool things like podcasts and people writing books and people being brave and, and restoring family relationships and just having others that can come alongside you and say, you know, I'm with you, I'm for you, and we can do this together. And I can encourage you. I don't need to even physically be with you. Um, and we've never met in person. That's what's so surprising about this yeah. group is we've never met in person, but we've created this sacred space where we're going to hold our best selves up for each other and reflect that back to say, I believe in you, you can do this and to spur one another on. Yeah. So I'm grateful. I'm so grateful for that circle. Yeah. Um, I, I want to ask you, because I mean, nowadays people tend to you know do the whole meeting online and my my circle of um girlfriends that I've met um is also all online we haven't met each other um but there's just this connection there I it just it's it's undeniable that you meet these people and you're like 
okay, there's, there's a connection. I don't know how it, it works. They're over on the other side of the world. I've got them in Canada, Barcelona, England, Argentina, you know, they're everywhere. But it, I don't know, do you find it amazing that you just meet these people and you just have this connection and you are able to, yes, I mean, at the beginning it was like, I'm trying to get to know each other, but you're just so open to, to help them and be vulnerable and also, um, you know, give, but also receive from them. And it's like, it's like they're family, but they're not. It, I don't, yeah. <laughs> do you find it like fascinating? Yes, I do. And I think that, you know, you would think your circle should be your family. Mm. And certainly I've had, I've had family members or people that feel family like from circles, but you know, you know, family, the people that love us unconditionally sometimes don't love us unconditionally. And so mm. Now, when you, you know, circles can be about family, but really it's about creating that family experience. And I've had some friends in circles, but, you know, friends don't always have your best interest in mind, or they can lead you down some wrong paths on occasion. I've had plenty of friends that have influenced me in difficult and not so great ways. And mm. so I believe that what's neat about circles is that we all come from this place of intention, where we're all coming at a place of love and encouragement and holding up our best selves for each other. And they can have family-like properties or they could have family. You can have, I've had family members in different circles and I've had friends in different circles, but I think the best circles are the ones where we just have this common agreement to say, hey, I'm here to encourage you, bottom line. And I don't have to think about anything else but reminding you of your best self. And um, I'm here for you. And so you're right, I agree that that sometimes the circles where we don't even know each other very well are some of the best because we don't bring this baggage or we don't bring this expectation that you have to, you know, reciprocate in a way that feels mutual always for friends, you know? Yeah. I believe we can come to this open space and hold it lightly and be all about encouraging and supporting each other on the journey. Yeah, I absolutely love that. And yeah, I wish that we can have, you know, everyone can have circles so that, you know, in, in times like, you know, in the world that we're living now, it just feels like, you know, everyone needs encouragement, needs that, you know, it needs that love, that unconditional love to, so that people can open up and be vulnerable and just, you know, be who they are and see other people for who they are and not what they think they are as well. So how do you, how do you, um, cause I haven't, I haven't started a circle. I just kind of got invited into this group. Like if people haven't found a circle and they're like, okay, well, I need to, I need to find people like me that can, you know, support me. How can they start, you know, something or, you know, how do they, how do they even, I know you mentioned that you kind of, um, with your, the magazine, group your you know that support group you kind of just kind of stumbled across them after asking for guidance but is are there any other avenues for people to start their own circle or actually go and find circles existing circles right absolutely well I think for me I, I kind of like to think of words how do you do this in, in a, a memorable way so mm. I always say it's better in 3d so life is better in a circle in 3d so the first yeah. d is decide decide what area in your life that you really want to go to work on. And it's going to be different for everybody, you know, deciding and saying, okay, where do I really want to spend some time or intention? So a couple of good questions to ask when you're deciding is where am I struggling right with, with right, right now? What's keeping me up at night or what's bugging me? And so first of all, is just deciding, like, where do you want to focus? Do you want to focus on your relationships, your health, your marriage, what is it you want to really want to focus on? So it's deciding first. That's the first D. The sec second D is determining and determining what it is you want your circle to look like. And in my head, I always think, what's the simplest way to do this? Mm -hmm. You know, a couple of good questions to ask might be, what would I want it to look like? And what's an easy way? What's the easiest way for me to connect with people that are interested in this area? And what is already in front of me? You know, you may have a neighbor that's also working on health, or you may have a friend, you know, like we talked about friends that are dedicated mm -hmm. to 
much. And, you know, I had a couple friends that were really good about healthy eating. And so I invited them to just pour into me. It doesn't have to be formal or informal. So again, it's, mm-hmm. so it's, it's deciding where you want to focus, determining how you want it to look like. And the third step is to dive in. And I think the hardest part is just to get started. So a couple of good questions to, to um, ask yourself would be, how can I make this meaningful? And what, what can I do to, to bring out the best in other people? And how do we hold each other accountable? And so it's kind of, it's those three, three Ds is deciding, determining, and diving in. Mm. And then considering what's in front of me, what faith communities am I part of? What's in my community already? What are my neighbors doing? You know, what are my friends up to? And how can they, how can they help me with this area? So I think it's being open and inviting, you know, that resource to show up for you. You know, it's like mm. I talked about, you know, asking God or yeah. inviting things to show up for you and, and being aware. So I think that with the proper intention of, um, and attention of looking for what's already in front of me, I think that people can be pretty creative in finding it. There's lots of online resources, you know, Facebook and yeah. social media are great ways to also connect there. I think Facebook pretty much has a group for almost every interest. <laughs> they probably do. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that's another great way to start. Or if you're part of any organizations or community groups, um, there's a lot of wonderful groups out there. So again, it's, it's even a simple search on the internet, you know, would probably mm. show you a lot of good possibilities. So, but I think the simplest is always the best. So it's about saying what's in front of me now and how can I leverage that to create a, a group that would support me? Yeah. And I love that because I, you know, in circles was is quite new for me. So I love that you mentioned that it doesn't have to be structured. You know, I mean, my group isn't structured, but it's, it's kind of like just this, we've just in this group, but just knowing that, you know, it could be just a couple of people and that can still be a circle is just having that person to support you in your intention and what you want to improve or get fresh ideas about, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. I want to ask you, um, this just popped into my head. Have you ever been in a circle where it hasn't worked for you? Um, I think, yes, I have actually. So I was part of a writer's circle and I was in charge of it. And so at the time I was doing a million other things. Like I was, um, I was taking care of my mom who was elderly and then I was homeschooling at the same time. And then I was doing some side, like not, you know, writing projects for a corporate environment too, as a project work. Mm. And so I had a million things on my plate. And then I had this writer's group that somehow I got put in charge of. (laughs) Um, I felt burdened by it. I felt like a burden, you know, it was, I loved it. And I knew writing is something I love and always want to do, but it felt like work. And it felt like I was working way too hard at something. And it was a great group. And we, we met together for several years where we would share our writing and would critique our writing and give ourselves feedback and, and um, share ideas. And so it was wonderful, but I felt like it had its season. Like I, I felt like at the time I had way too many things on my plate Hmm. and, you know, when you have too many things on your plate, you're not really doing anything well. So you're not serving anybody, even though the writing group on its own was a good thing. And it was something I loved. It just wasn't what was right in that season for me. And so I just, I just basically said, you know, guys, I love you and I support you, but I, this is not for me in the season. And I can't lead this group any longer. Mm. And so definitely it's, a, there's a time and a place and it's knowing where you're at and being true to yourself and saying, this is great and wonderful, but it has to be in a way that can serve me and not take away or suck the life out of me, if you will. So yeah, it's about re- being real, you know, and saying, okay, do I have time to meet with people? I don't. So it must be, I might have to do this virtually, or I might have to do it informally, or I might have to say, hey, friend, can you check on me every quarter to see how I'm doing on this goal of mine? Um, it doesn't have to be like a lot of time or super intense um, mm-hmm meeting time, but it's finding a way in a situation to make it work for your life in a way that doesn't drive you crazy or take up too much time. You know what I mean? So I think that you have to be very clear on how is it going to work for you in a way that also serves you and fuels you as well. Yeah. I love that. Thank you for sharing that. Um, And this, this other question popped up as you were talking, Um, have you been in more than one circle at a time? Um, yes. Well, yes, I have an ongoing circle right now. So I have my, my um, She Loves group, yeah. which I talked about as well. That's my, my creative, we call yeah. ourselves the creative curators group now. <laughs> uh, 
because um, we basically inspire creativity in each other. Yeah. And we didn't start off that way, but we call ourselves the Creative Curators Group. And then I'm also part of a weekly community of faith um, where we get together. It's mostly couples. Um, mm. We get together almost every week and we just, in, in the summer, we take a break. But during the regular season of life, we um, get together and have, have dinner together once a week. And we usually study something, whether it's a book, like we, we studied Enneagrams together and how we can, I don't know if your readers or your listeners know about Enneagrams, but it's your personality traits yes. and um, bringing more of that into your forth in your life to manifest through service is what we've been, we studied yeah. together. Um, we've also studied anxiety together and marriage and family. And so I have a group that we meet together as couples to pray for each other. We have food together, which is wonderful when everybody cooks for each other. Yeah. And, um, and then we also study something as well. So I've had that. And I also have my creative curators group. Um, so yeah, I've had a couple of groups, but you know, in different seasons, it always will look different. And you're, you're going to be struggling with different things in different seasons, right? Mm. So we all struggle, all of us struggle. I struggle a lot still. And so, I mean, I feel like it's a, a chance to recreate yourself in each season to say, what do I need most right now? And what, what is, well, how is God calling me or how, what is it I need to bring forth more of in my life right now? And how can I, how can I manifest that? I, you know, surrounding myself with people that can encourage me along the way. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. I want to ask you a question because you speak um, about life in seasons and I haven't had, you know, I've, I've interviewed over 50 guests and there's not too many that talk about life in seasons. I, I just, I don't know, this just popped into my head to ask you um, why you speak about life in seasons, like what has, you know, I guess happened in your life that has made you, you know, see it as seasons, I guess. That's my question. Yeah. Well, um, one of my favorite books, which I know we'll probably talk about later is um, Anne Morrill Lindbergh wrote the book called Gifts from the Sea. Mm. And she talks about the different seasons of life um, according to shells, like the various shells that are out in the ocean. Mm -hmm. And I, so I read that book as a young young woman, probably in my 20s, and I thought, oh, that's so interesting, but I want to do all of my life right now. <laughs> and so I think that when you're young, you think I can do everything, I can do all of it, and I want to do all of it right now. And so that book kind of planted this idea in my life that, you know, you don't, you can't do all of it right now, but you can do it in different seasons, you know, and so it's just a beautiful metaphor for like, you don't have to do it all, but you in each season is unique. And it poses unique challenges and unique blessings. So, you know, the homeschool season was like busy with activities and sports and, you know, friends and kids coming over and loud and noisy, mm -hmm. you know, that season was in itself and it was wonderful and good and busy. And so I loved it. And now I'm in a season of empty nesting. And so personally, I'm really struggling there right now because I feel like, oh my gosh, I have this empty house and I miss my son and my kids so much and all of his friends and all these sport things. And now it's just this kind of silent world I live in, you know, or it's not as busy and yeah. wonderful as this. But, you know, I'm being reminded, God's kind of reminding me that everything in its season, right? There's blessings and there's challenges. Like the challenges are the grief. And how am I recreating myself in this new season? And, but there's blessings in it. My husband and I have a lot more time together now, which can be challenging. <laughs> I'm learning like, okay, we're kind of reinventing our marriage now. That's cool. We actually get to date again yeah. because we don't have all this busy season. And so, and we're also caregiving from my um, father-in-law who's 96. And so he's at his, you know, like the, the sunset season. And mm. so it's sitting with him, like yesterday I sat with him and I just, listen to him and he has so much wisdom and you know he's the last of our family members that are old you know he's the yeah. he's like the keeper of the flame and so I don't want to miss this season with him you know because he's not going to be here mm. forever and so you know I'm just trying to realize that every season has its blessings and its challenges but it's important not to mourn like for a while I think I mourned the loss of the season of the childbearing years where I was like man I miss all that so much I don't know if I'll ever have a season as meaningful as that season, you know, was of the child years, you know, mm -hmm. I don't know if I feel that significant of being a, a parent and a caregiver again. And then God's kind of showing me that, you know what, this season is equally as meaningful. It's just going to look different. And so you have to find your way to, 
to really treasure that and to find the blessings and the challenges in it. So I believe that, you know, every season has its gifts. And so you just have to be ready to, to be aware of what they are. Yeah. Oh, I just, I love that explanation that, you know, how you, how you tell it, you know, you are definitely a really amazing storyteller. You just have this beautiful <laughs> way of explaining things and talking about things. So thank you. That is, that is very beautiful. And yeah, I, I just love how you explain the different seasons because I, I, you know, I'm nearly 40, I'm 40 next year, but, um, you know, I was, I'm, I was the same, you know, I want to do everything. I want everything I want to do. I want to be, I want to have everything right now, <laughs> right now, yeah. this minute. <laughs> I think we can, but we can't. <laughs> but it's, um, I think um, once you kind of go through and just let go and surrender to your journey, you realize that you can't, like, like you say, you can have it all, but it's in your different seasons on the different yeah, part of your journey. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. Um, since we were talking about, book, about books, what are some other books that have really, you know, helped you, um, you know, transform your life or, you know, you think that people should have, a, should read? Hey, um, gosh, I have so many books and my dad was a huge reader. He always wanted us to have a book in our hand at all times. <laughs> and so <laughs> always giving us books. But I know I mentioned Gifts from the Sea. That's kind of one, I, I give that, uh, to as a gift book to almost either every um every graduation or every marriage because i believe it's a book that everybody should have in their life library if you will um mm. about um one of the books that i read with my son in high school which i believe every young person probably needs to read is night by ellie weasel mm. and that book kind of broke my heart the writing in it is beautiful and heartbreaking but at the same time it's a huge reminder never to take um, our family or our freedom or our faith for granted um, because it's all about um, the Holocaust, but he writes from a place of such depth of brokenness. It's a very short book. It's mm. like a hundred and some pages, but it's just a heartbreaking reminder of never to take our faith, our family and our freedom for granted. So I believe every person should read that book. Um, mm. And lastly, one, a funny book, which probably nobody knows about, but it's called Contiki. And it's a book, uh, it's a book that was written in 1948 by a Norwegian writer. And my dad gave this book to me um, when I was about 10 or 11. And again, it's remembering that we can feminine kid that I know who I am and I know what I want. Yeah. And so my dad gave me that book when I was about 10 or 11. And I thought it I was so mad that he wanted me to read it because I thought it was ridiculous. The theme, the, the whole story of the book is basically that it's this uh, Norwegian guy that decides to build this balsa raft that he's going to, his goal and his dream is to cross the Pacific ocean to see if he could do it, you know? And I thought, how dumb is that? Like who builds a raft? Just it's perfectly <laughs> boats out there. You know, why, why someone would build a balsa raft and want to cross the Pacific ocean, but that was his dream. And he did it for no other good reason than it lived in him. And so, and I argue with my dad, I was like, why are you making me read this book? It's terrible. But now every time I see it, I'm reminded that you know, this guy had this dream. And so sometimes I think we discount our dreams because we think that there's no good reason to live this dream. And, and just because it lives in my heart, it's not a good enough reason. But as I've, you know, as life has happened, mm -hmm. I feel like I've come to realize that because a dream lives in you, even if it's ridiculous, it's still a dream and it's a dream that won't go away. And so therefore it needs to be brought forth. Mm -hmm. And so Every time I see that, I'm reminded of my dad and the power of dreaming a dream, no matter if it's ridiculous, no matter if it makes no good sense, but because it's a dream in, in your heart and it lives in your heart, it's reason enough. And that is enough to bring it forth into your life. Yeah. Oh, that's so beautiful. <laughs> that's so, so beautiful. Um, because so many people are so scared to realize their dreams you know mm -hmm. so it's so important to remind ourselves to just you know if something keeps popping up and popping up if you're meant to create it you, you know it's the thoughts create things and you know you're supposed to somehow create it if it keeps popping up there is a reason why right um so which you know um kind of brings me to the next question to ask you you know for people who have these dreams and they're you know too scared to to you know create it because they think 
oh, it's just ridiculous. What advice would you have for them to, you know, start creating? Yeah. Um, I think of the quote, one of my favorite quotes is by Mary Oliver. And she asked this question where she says, and I might be paraphrasing a little bit, mm. but she said, what is it you plan to do with this one wild and precious life? Mm -hmm. And I just love that quote because when I'm struggling or I'm like, oh, should I do this? Should I not? Uh, is this a good goal? Is this a bad, like, how do I handle this? I ask myself that question and it kind of reminds me again, back to that 10 year old self that I know who I am. I know what I want. What is it you plan to do with this one wild and precious life? And if COVID, you know, the pandemic has taught me anything, I don't want to waste any more time on things that don't matter. I don't want to, you know, sit there and worry, am I good enough to have this goal? Or, you know what, I don't want to waste any more time because I only get one chance to do this well. And I don't know how long I get to live on this earth. And so I just feel like, you know, right now I'm in a season where I'm like, you know what, what the heck, go for it anyway, um, because you only get to live this life one time and you might as well have some fun and make, you know, do some adventures and live some adventures and make for good stories along the way. So whenever I'm considering like I'm feeling stuck or I'm unsure about what I want, what I should do, I ask myself that question. What is it you plan to do with this one wild and precious life? And then just get after it and see what happens. Yeah, that's awesome. Is there anything right now that, you know, that, you want to do and go, Hey, just, just do it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. I, um, so I feel like right now I'm in this season of adventure. Like I feel like I'm kind of in ready to kind of have this season of adventures. And, um, so for a long time, I dreamed this dream about learning to surf. And so I just long to surf. And again, you know, it was this dream where I'm like, Oh gosh, every time I see like a documentary on surfing or women in surfer magazines, I'm like, Oh, it's so cool. They're so confident, yeah. strong, powerful. And I'm like, Oh, I want to do that so much. And I'm like, but I could never do that. There's no good reason to do that. You know, I'm, you know, I'm older ish and um, you know, it's expensive and there's sharks and there's jellyfish and there's rip currents and, and so the water's cold and I don't even know physically if I can get up on a surfboard or what if I hate surfing? And so <laughs> there's no good reason to do this, but you know, again, this is a dream that lives in me and it won't go away. And so this year I'm like, you know what, I'm, I'm living that dream. And I've decided that because that dream lives in me, that is a good enough reason. And so, but when I went to live this dream of learning to surf, I'm like, I don't think I can do it by myself. There's no way I could do it. So again, I powered up the circle idea and I said, who can help me on this journey? Who can help me learn how to surf? And so I did the simplest thing that I knew how to do, which is taking a walk, because I knew if I was going to learn how to surf, I needed to get physically stronger. So I found a couple people. I'm like, hey, friends, you know, I know you walk a lot. So would you make a walking date on a regular basis with me like every Tuesday so I can get physically stronger? And they're like, yeah, yeah. So I have walking friends. And then I had some fitness friends and I'm like, hey, I need to be able to be upper body. I need to be stronger in my upper body. Can you teach me like good push up form or planks or like, how do you do a burpee? Yeah. And they're like, yeah. So teach me about upper body strength. And then I had another person I knew that's really good at wellness and nutrition. And because I knew if I'm going to surf, I need to be physically strong and fueled up. And so I said, can we swap healthy recipes? Because I need to know how to cook, you know, more healthy things. Yeah. And, um, and I knew that if I had a date on the calendar that I would be, I wouldn't chicken out. And mm -hmm. so I asked my 20 year old son, I said, will you do this thing with me? Because I know if I have you by my side, I'll be brave. And also if I get stuck in a rip current, you could probably rescue me. <laughs> <laughs> You're young and you can save me. And so I put it on the calendar. And so I had all these things like kind of an alignment. And I had a, another friend that we would talk each other, talk to each other by phone once a month and say, Hey, how's it going on your surf challenge? And I would, she would ask me about my surf challenge. And I would ask her, she wanted to do a push up challenge where she could get a hundred push ups. Yeah. And so check on each other. And so this past May was the first time I actually surfed for the first time in the Outer Banks of North Carolina. Wow. Now, did I surf perfectly? No. Did I surf world-class? No. But I got up on this board and I tell you what a blast it was to be able to get up on that board for the first time and to be able to say like, I am the kind of person who surfs and, um, you know, big deal. So what? So I surfed, right? And you can't help but know that when you do something like that, it changes you. Mm. And when you bring forth something that's in your heart, that's a dream. And 
it just can't help but have this halo effect on everything you do. And so it changes you from your confidence in your, in your life, whether it's pursuing more goals or in your relationships for people that have come alongside you and get to celebrate and, and be a part of that milestone. But mm-hmm. it can't help change you as a result of pursuing and taking that dream that's in your heart and bringing it forth into your life. So I really feel like I'm in a season of just trying new things and being more, more bold. I recently got um, two stand up in, inflatable paddle boards, stand up um, paddle boards. Yeah. So I can take them and travel around. So we've been um, learning how to paddle board too, which is yeah. really fun. But again, it's bringing forth that dream in your heart for no good reason other than that it lives in you. Yeah. And I want to do this. <laughs> 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 yeah that's so awesome and I just love that whole you know your adventure your story because it goes to show you know you powering up your circles okay that's like circles in action right <laughs> like this person this person <laughs> like these people and then you know going to create your dream and make it come true and just doing it anyway so that's just so amazing. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sure it will inspire a lot of people who's listening. And I want to ask you, you know, you've gone through so much. You've had such a colorful life from, you know, what I've heard and talked to you so far in your journey. I want to ask you, if you could time travel back to a younger version of you, what advice would you give yourself? Oh my gosh, there's so many things. <laughs> um, the first thing I would say is hard doesn't mean wrong. Mm. Um, I think when life gets hard, we think that we should just quit or it's, we're not in the right situation or that it's wrong for us. But I believe when hard, when things get hard is when the good stuff starts. And so I really wish that another wise voice or my wise self would have told me at a young age that, you know, just because things are hard, doesn't mean it's wrong and you can get through this. Um, I think that's when we really need to start applying more creativity and more industriousness and more, Um, involving others to just come alongside us and say, hey, I'm in this situation, but I don't know what to do. Um, And when you're in your 20s, you don't want to ever ask for help. And so I believe that remembering that hard doesn't mean wrong. Um, I I wish I would have gotten, I wish I would have had a, you know, a wealth coach like you that could have come alongside me to say, get world class at figuring out your financial stuff and really knowing how to take care of yourself financially. Because when you got your, when you get your finances right, it gives you so much freedom to be able to do and live and pursue things according to your dreams. So I wish I would have gotten world-class at understanding finances and how to use that as a tool, a powerful tool to seek whatever I wanted to do in life. Um, Again, we talked about asking for help because people really want to help you. People love to be involved in helping you on your journey and not to do life alone Um, and surrounding people that bring out the best in you. Um, I just believe that, you know, there's an expression that says people create their homes with the materials in their midst. And so I believe whoever you surround yourself with is who you will ultimately become. And I don't think I recognize how powerful that really is until much later in life. Like you have a lot of potato chip friends or junkie friends that are not bringing out the best in you. So not that to say that every friend needs to be a Mm world-class amazing person, but just to be very intentional and to be very aware that whoever you're spending time with is who you're ultimately going to be becoming. Yeah. Um, so thinking about that. And lastly, and this isn't me, la- there's no good reason to hang out in bars after midnight. <laughs> I, just, <laughs> I just tell my son this, I say, nothing good ever happens past midnight. And so I wish like somebody would have kind of like, set that rule that, you know, don't be hanging out in bars after midnight. Nothing good happens past midnight anyway. So it's not bring, bringing out your best self to be in the bar past midnight. So. <laughs> yeah. You're being there a bit too long. <laughs> <Right on. laughs> Judgment on bars, but I'm just saying like after midnight, it's not good. So go home. Yeah, that's awesome advice. Thank you for sharing that. (laughs) And Cara, um, before we wrap up, I, you know, I always like to ask my guests this um, last question is, you know, because my journey has been about the self-love and the self-worth, you know, that, that, you know, that part. So I want to ask you, what does self-love you know, mean to you? And, you know, we've touched on a lot of self-love things along the way in this conversation, but, you know, if you were to put it in very articulately, what does it actually mean to you? I think it's about honoring that awakened feminine, that 
I know who I am and I know what I want. I think a lot of times we confuse like what you should be doing or what you shouldn't, you know, ob- out of obligation or, you know, and there's certain things that we have to do obligatorily, you know, mm. but it's honoring that. I think self-love is about honoring that. I know who I am and I know what I want. It's honoring that. And not to say that every choice is like that, but when you can honor that place in yourself um, to say, I know who I am and I know what I want um, and I'm going to give it the best care. I think that's, that's all about self-love. Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. And, you know, what do you like to do to give yourself, you know, that self-love that you deserve? Oh, man. I'm a huge, like, nighttime ritual bath person. And so I know that sounds cheesy probably, but I love, I love, I'm really into taking hot bath every night and using awesome Epsom salts because I feel like it's really relaxing for me. I'm not a super great sleeper. So it helps me with having a nighttime ritual to take a hot bath with Epsom salts every night, practically. I love to take walks and be in nature. I'm huge into like being outdoors and loving the outdoors and just taking that time to allow myself to be present to all of it, whether it's super steamy, like it is in the South right now in North, in North Carolina, it's yeah. very, you know, steamy and luxurious. I feel like it's velvety, <laughs> but, um, but I love to be outside in nature and just being present to that. And, you know, for me personally, like if I can take a nap, like on a Saturday afternoon, that is just like the most luxurious of ways to care for yourself. Yeah. <laughs> I love taking naps or just to lay down with a good blanket for like, you know, half an hour is so, it's yeah. just so good. I feel so much better. Yeah. Oh, thank you so much. I love naps too. <laughs> so <laughs> definitely awesome. Uh, um, so thank you. Thank you so much, Cara. I've really enjoyed, talk, you know, talking to you. I can, I think I can talk to you all day really <laughs> if I could, but you know, we, time's up for us today. Um, so thank you so much for sharing your love and wisdom with us. And, you know, you're just such a beautiful person. If people want to, you know, find out more about you or, you know, because I know you do, you know, mentor people about homeschooling and, or, you know, just helping people be a better version of themselves and encourage them to live their best life. Where can people find you? Yes, I can certainly share a link to my website in your show notes, but it's, um, my website is uh, caramclaughlinlife.com. And I know it's tricky to spell and pronounce, so I'll include a link for your show notes. And as well as I have like a freebie for your listeners about how to start a circle, the three Ds oh, awesome. that I talked about. So I have a nice a free downloadable sheet that gives the three Ds or the three ways to start a circle. And then like many ideas or a list of ideas that they can get started with a circle. So um, I'll link to that in your show notes as well. Amazing. Thank you so much, Kara. I'll have all your details and any recommended resources and um, you know, if you have the um, the circle starter as well, I'll put that all into the show notes so people can, you know, have that and also reach out to you if they want to. Thank you so much once again. Thank you, Kaki. Thank you, Kara. Until next time, I love you. I believe in you and you are worth taking that step to the life of your dreams. <laughs>